a couple of people have said that. And I, you know, it's a guesstimate. Yeah. If I live a long time, it'll, I'll be really glad I did. Right, that. right. <laughs> I don't. Understood. Somebody will get a great car. Yes. Okay. So yeah, that's why it's, when it's weird in that regard, not to yes. like a regular house. Yeah. Regular right. Yes. Person. Right. You're not in the same ball game. Exactly. Yeah. So, um. Good. And, uh, hopefully I'll you know, I'm going to move this. I'm going to move this back so that okay, that's no. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah.
ਸੋਚਿਆ You're about five minutes early. First of all, I, I have uh, two hats on today. Um, I'm actually the president of the board of trustees of the Oyster Ponds Historical Society. And I'm also the lecturer, so I'm introducing myself today. So um, just be aware of that. Um, there are, I just want to say, membership forms. If anybody is interested in helping out the society in any shape, form, or manner, there are forms in the back that you could sign up for, and it would be very greatly appreciated. But today's talk is really about a little bit about the society, but mostly about the houses. So this was up there, uh, excuse me, this I just put up. And the Historical Society was founded in 1944. Um, it was organized to preserve the historical significance of Orient and East Marion, a community that was still largely populated by direct descendants. The names of many of the families are the same names from 300 years ago. And it's um, a phenomenon fast vanishing. So this was back in 1944. They recognized that times were changing, and they wanted to try to preserve some of that. So the founding members felt concern about the gradual but constant disappearance of documents, family records, tools, art, Native American artifacts, and other surviving relics of the maritime, agricultural, cultural, and religious life of the early settlers of Orient and East Mary. So that's a little bit of history behind it. And again, Every organization has a mission statement, what they're involved in, what they're trying to do. 
And this is the newest version, only a couple of months old. Oyster Ponds Historical Society celebrates and shares North Fork culture, heritage through education, exhibition, scholarship, collecting, preserving, and interpreting the history of Orient, East Marion community, and its place in national history. That's the purpose of the society. That's what it's trying to do at this moment. And in order to do that, uh, just to give you some idea, um, there are thousands and thousands of documents. There's over 75,000 items in the collection, ranging over five centuries. The heart of our collection is the archives, which contain more than 12,000 documents, photographs, and other works of paper, which are irreplaceable and must be properly protected. That's part of our um, newest mission, is to protect those items. Um, this was a picture by William Stiebel Davis, an artist, who had the, was the main exhibit last summer. And um, the museum's artifacts represent a significant and diverse collection. 18th, 19th, 20th century furniture, maritime paintings, decorative arts, and local tools. Uh, this picture was just donated to the society. So if you need shoes, you want to look at them, come and look at them. You need uh, toys, a whole, there could be thousands of these in there. This is just a cross section. This is a little child's wagon. They push each handle, they run around down the road. Games, all preserved through the donations of people of East Marion and Orient. So all of these collections come about through donations. Clothes, some interesting outfits, might not be uh, the most recent. Um, this is a painting, a, a very primitive painting, and it was just returned by the FBI a couple of months ago. Um, if you want to find the whole story, on April 3rd, Bill McNaught, who's a world-famous curator who happens to be at Oyster Ponds, Bill is going to be here all right, on April 3rd giving the highlights of the community, uh, of the collection, excuse me. I'm doing the houses, which is part of the collection, but it's the big things, houses. Bill is going to do some of the items, and I know that this will be one of his items that he talks about, and you'll find out why the FBI was involved. The quilts, furniture, all sorts of different things in the collection. It's a wide, wide collection, and I'm not going to spend time on the collection because Bill is going to be doing that uh, in a couple of weeks. I highly advise you coming to see that. Now, just to give you a reference for some of you might not know, Orient, the very tip of the North Fork, goes down to a narrow little bend, and then East Marion. OHS, Oyster Ponds Historical Society, is right in the middle of both of them. A close-up picture that you might recognize, Latham's Farm Stand, the yellow farm stand here. This is the main road. Candyman, we all know where that is. That's right here. And this is Village Lane going down through the center of the town. OHS is down near the bottom of it. A close-up, there's Village Lane again. And the first house we're going to talk about is Village House. Village House was the first building 1944, that's when the society started, they bought this building. Now, other people than I have set this up in four different stages, the history of the building. Augustus Griffin recorded in his diary that he built his house in 1798. That house is still there, parts of it. Um, if you look at the dates, Please note, he lived to be 99 years old. Supposedly, he vote, voted for George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. That's pretty unique. He um, kept diaries and wrote a book. And in it, he's half gossip, half narrator. And he fills in the daily life over 50 or 60 years, what neighbors did what, 
who lived in this house. Uh, fascinating, fascinating history. Uh, there is a copy of Augustus Griffin's book. And um, next month when we have the collections, we'll have a bunch of books that you can look at that we have. But he's a very interesting character, and he's built the house in 1798. In his diary on July 25th, I purchased me a building a lot near the harbor at Oyster Ponds. Notice it's called Oyster Ponds back then. This is 1798. Half acre for $50. Sounds like a good buy. October, my house was raised. It is one story, 27 by 22 feet. That's the whole house. And I've circled the original. You can walk into the building, come this summer, walk, come down, walk into the building, the same floors, the same, everything is there in those two rooms. That They have been preserved. So that was the, the house that he lived in. A few, 10 years later, he added a lean-to, 11 foot. To give you some idea, on 32, he put a second story, and I'll try to explain some of this. So he's expanding his room. Now, why did all that have to happen? Here's some of the things. In 1809, he had a tavern's license. So now, that little space was his home, but it was also a tavern. He was a school teacher. He boarded students at some times. He had classes at some times, all of that in those two little rooms with the shed in the back. Um, he was a collector of taxes. Uh, he had an impression, I, I use the word unofficial mayor maybe. You know how some people just sort of take over a town or something? It seems that that was his role, that, that a lot of things happened around him and around his house. So it wasn't just a house, it had a lot of other social activities uh, with it. To give you an idea, in the 1810 census, there were six children plus one. Now, who that was, there's no, but when you fill the census out, you had to do it that way. And he and his wife living in those two rooms. And having a tavern and classes and a number of other things. Um, he was always in... Um, a dilemma of selling liquor or not selling it. He made money by selling it, but he saw the damage it did to some people's lives. So he was always conflicted, and slowly but surely he gave up selling liquor and turned it more into a community um, center and boarding house. That's when upstairs came on, and so he needed more rooms. So he's expanding at that time. Now, I put this down because he, he notes Washington's birthday. We'll get back to this a little bit later. This is 1842. Um, in 1841, an organization called the Washingtonian Temperance Society was formed. A year later, there were a million members. Orient, if you're not familiar, I gave this lecture uh, six months or so ago at Pocatuck Hall, but Orient was the center of the temperance unit on the whole North Fork. When they voted for the amendment to get rid of prohibition, Orient, two to one, not to get rid of it. Two to one. The rest of Suffolk County was three to one the other way. Orient has a long history. And Washington's birthday was February 22nd, and he talks about a dinner that took place. And that dinner occurred for the next hundred years, literally. And in, in the 1920s, there were 300 people at that dinner, February 22nd, in the middle of Orient. So it was a major occurrence for many, many years. And then finally in 1853, he's now in his 80s, so you know he's not into boarding houses, he's not into a lot of activity, he sells the house, moves on. Made a few dollars, too. The next phase, the Vale family buys the house. This is the second phase. So the transformation of Griffin's house into a boarding house. All right? More than double in size. So this is the second phase. Now, that's his original house. He added the upstairs. If you look at it from the front, that's the original house. 
All that was added in 1853. So if we look at it, the front door, on uh, the stairs, uh, there's a, an entrance way and the stairs are right there. The old stairs that went upstairs were taken down. New stairs were placed in. You can see the outline of the old stairs in some places. The, this is a large front parlor. Notice the windows, almost floor to ceiling. Um, this is the whole front parlor. Upstairs, there are three little bedrooms. Um, probably 10 feet by 12 feet, maybe. Maybe. And each one of these windows is a separate bedroom. If you look again, uh, let me get the next button. Um, there's a bedroom here, off the main parlor. So they're adding bedrooms for people to stay in. And there's a back parlor that mirrors this, and there's another bedroom off the back parlor. They also, uh, the lean-to was taken down, and two new story east extension. A dining room on the first floor, right here, and family bedrooms on the second floor. So now all these are rooms that are being rented out. Um, I have to tell you, from uh, early on, this was a stagecoach stop. I have to go back to that. That that this is even back in Griffin's time. This was one of the stagecoach stops as the stagecoach went out to Orient Point to pick up whatever, and all the way back. It was a, so there were people staying there occasionally on, on a fairly regular basis. But later, there was tremendous business from people from the city. There were city people back then. And the train came to Greenport, I think 1844, 45, and the ships from the city would come out a couple of times a week, drop off families, and they would stay in Orient for uh, summers, weekends. So there was a lot of activity, and that's why there was money to be made, and that's why this became an active boarding house. They also built a service wing, kitchen, mudroom, laundry, pantries, all of that needed to um, function as a boarding house. And here's the advertisement for it. Mrs. Jeremiah Vale, Village House, Orient, Long Island. Boating, fishing, bathing, large rooms, eight to ten dollars. No notice, Long Island Railroad. You could take that right out to Greenport. Or you could get to Jane Slip or the Peck Slip and pick up boats on a regular schedule. The next phase, it's still in its boarding house phase, but the historians put this in here. And the, the only changes in this was that they were uh, wallpaper put up in the parlors and painted frieze in the hall. This was to decorate it, to make it a little better than it was. So it tried to move the boarding house up a notch, if you understand. And this is my picture. That's the frieze that was painted on. And you can see the wallpaper in the background. We'll look at that a little closer. That's 1880s wallpaper. It's still there. In the early 20th century, the boarding house business, the veils, like, like Griffin, the veils were getting older, so they in turn decided, let's not work too much anymore, and they backed off and used it as a residence. So it was no longer a boarding house. The fourth stage, 1944, that's the date, again, when the society bought the house. So from uh, 1944 to now, Oyster Ponds Historical Society has owned it. So think of that, three owners over 200 and something years, Griffin, Vale, and the Society. That's it. Um, this is that same parlor from the picture that I just showed you the other way. And that's some of the collections that were put out in the parlor. So, the most recent stage of Village House history is a museum building under the auspices of the Historical Society. Just to let you see, um, there's a tremendous collection of nautical paints. Jacobson's paints, models we have. Um, you can see a bunch of uh, old rifles up here. It's part of the collection. 
This is the front parlor, as it might have looked back in Victorian age. Again, you can see the wallpaper there. This is with all of the um, parts of the collection up anyway. But in 2005 or so, the uh, society got a $250,000 grant from New York State and had a match to that. So they put in over a half a million dollars and took down uh, a lot of the basic construction and um, replaced what had to be replaced, put it that way. There was no heat in the building for all that time. There was obviously no air conditioning. It has now all been um, winterized, so we have humidity control, we have temperature control, um, all of those, and, and it's complete museum quality. It's all automated, computer access, all of that kind of thing to um, bring it up to date. So a lot of work was done, and when that work was done, um, all that furniture that you just saw was moved out and hasn't been back in there because they've been working on it all this time. So, yeah, uh, well, the furniture's just been stored. It hasn't been restored yet. Um, so you can see where things had to come down, they had to come down. Otherwise, they saved everything they could save. We're now in phase three. If you look at the wallpaper, you can see. You can see the, the woodwork here. Uh, if I go to the next picture, you see the paint peeling. Uh, this is Mary Jablonski, who's a uh, restorer from New York City. She did the Tenement Museum, if you're at all familiar with that. Uh, we hired her to come out, and um, she spent two weeks just putting the wallpaper back. Let me try to explain. There were pieces like this big that had just pulled off the wall, and they were just hanging down. Again... This paper is from 1885 or 80s, late 80s. And so they had restored it, and all this wood was scraped down to bare wood and repainted in the last three weeks. It's now completely done. Um, somebody asked about furniture. Um, this complete set of Victorian parlor furniture is original to Orient. It spent its whole life. Uh, in the Terry family for almost 150 years before it was donated to the society. The furniture will be featured in the back parlor of the village house when it has been repaired. So if anybody has five or six thousand dollars that they're willing to separate, um, this all has to be repaired. Some of this is horse hide, um, and it, it's very, it's like $245 a yard for just the fabric. So that's a little bit information about Village House. Uh, we only have six more to go. <laughs> the others are a little quicker. So that's Village House. The next one, 1949, the society gets the Old Point Schoolhouse, District Number One, Down Neck. Down Neck meant you lived east of Orient. East, okay, out by the point. It was no, there were two school districts, and Down Neck was from like Narrow River out is where the map is. It's from Narrow, where Narrow River gains the main road. Um, again, just to show you, there's Village House. The schoolhouse is on the campus property, is right next to it, set back a little ways. The Down Neck was built in 1873 to replace the 1845 building. It was on the north side of the main road, west of Orient Point, a mile or a mile and a half west of Orient Point. But it was on the main road. That's what it looked like. And you can see the students look very enthusiastic. <laughs> That's what the inside looked like. It's kind of a classic picture from way back when. The building was last used in 1929, was abandoned in 1930, when the districts were consolidated. Obviously, there weren't too many people in either school, and so they brought both of them together into the Orient School. 
The original cupola was destroyed by the 38 hurricane. The bell was lost. I always, this was uh, written down somewhere and I just thought it was, the bell was lost. We'll get back to that in a minute. After the school closed, uh, it was used by Ed King as a dormitory for mar migrant farm workers. So you see it out. Notice how crowded Orient was then. This is the main road. This is a picture from the main road. And that schoolhouse is out there. However, in 1949, the school was donated by Ed King to the society. And miraculously, the bell was found. Where it went, I don't know. But it was found, quote unquote. So now the building was moved. This is the first building that was moved to the property. Not the last, but the first. And it was set up high so that it was out of the floodplain. The actual, um, see where the flagpole is? Uh, let me point it out to you. You can't. This is the base of it. Um, the hurricane we had, Sandy, the water was right up here. Just again, this was about a foot deep along Village Lane. So just to give you some idea. So that's higher and drier than um, it would have been if it was down just on the ground. Um, upstairs is a exhibition room. This is the quilt collection. There were four centuries of quilts. And this was two years ago. I told you William Steeple Davis um, was last year's. This was the year before. You just get a wonderful picture of um, a series of quilts. Um, this was William Steeple. There, he's one of my favorites. Um, do you see the the ship down here? This is Orient Wharf, the yacht club, and this is one of the steamships from the city. This he drew when he was eight years old. Kind of neat. Downstairs has been a library, a workroom. Obviously, this is many years ago. And um, work was done now. It's an office. It still forms some books, but it's mainly a, a staff office. Um, it's also the center for a number of things. Heritage Day. I, I invite all of you to come out to Heritage Day. If you want Americana at its best, that's it. Kids on bicycles decorated, a parade, and um, they read the um, Declaration of Independence. A series of students, adults, male, female, they all get together and read part of it. Um, Augustus Griffin talks about reading the Declaration of Independence in the eight, early 1800s outside his house. This is outside his house. So it's a wonderful day. Um, Another celebration that we have there is North Fork Fresh. This is a fundraiser. And it pioneered the so-called farm to table. This was started 15 or 20 years ago when no one knew about the farm to table. And this really started that whole um, movement. And a lot of people have copied it since. So that's a little bit of information about the schoolhouse. Next. The Halleck Building. It's behind Village House. This was acquired in 1960. And this is where the building was originally built in 1891. This is the Halleck Farm. This is out further east by the, I guess you'd say, uh, Narrow River Road comes down. The Halleck Buildings are still around there where... Um, uh, Bob Burks has a studio back in that area. Um, this was a very, very, very successful farm. I can't stress. It pioneered a lot of different things to bring food to the city. It wasn't just uh, a farm. It did a lot of different things. And uh, it, it was really a, a study amongst itself. But this building was originally used as the cookhouse and dormitory for the Halleck Farm. And this is the building all the way over there on the right. And if we look a little bit at a close up, um, the first floor was a kitchen pantry. The second floor housed beds. Now, again, it was getting old and there were problems. So what do you do? You put it on a trailer. And again, 
Um, during the winter, obviously, the fields are frozen, and it's just dragged down to Village Lane. And it's pushed in. You can see, this is the old the schoolhouse. You see it back there. This, right here, is um, Village House, Augustus Griffith's house. So again, they're parking it right behind that. That's the Halleck building. The society has extensively remodeled the interior, first to serve as a gallery. And you can see they used it as a, a, a museum gallery. Again, paintings, a lot of maritime stuff that we have is, is right there. Um, today, however, um, it, you have to understand that they, they uh, upgraded the insulation, the heat, the uh, whole heating system so that um, now the building houses the majority of the documents, paintings, and artifacts. This is a clean picture. I, I was tempted to show you some of the other corridors where, you know, if you watch the pickers, you know, people climbing over things to get stuff. Um, it's filled beyond capacity. And I just felt it wouldn't be right to do that for Bill and Amy, who work over there, uh, to blame them for it. But you, everything is labeled. All sorts of things happen. It's also um, a library research. If any of you want to delve into the history of uh, a lot of different things that happened in Orient and East Marion, um, you can come and look. And regularly people come and look for the, the, the primary documents, the actual documents that you need to do uh, original research. Um, I told you that um, Bill McNaught was going to give a talk. Freddie Waxberger is also going to give a talk on April 24th. She's written a wonderful book that I highly recommend that I'm sure she'll bring with her to her talk. It, it, it's basically two women's letters over uh, a number of years explaining life going on at that time. I don't want to ruin her whole talk, so I'll just leave it that way. But this talk will be at Poquatuck Hall in Orient. And we've, we've arranged for buses to bring anybody from Peconic Landing out to see us and to be part of that talk also. So put that on your calendars also. April 24th. So that's a little bit of information about the Halleck building. Next, the Red Barn. And it's called The Red Barn. Um, it, it was bought in 1966. The barn was originally constructed as a grain market down near the wharf. The Orient Wharf was a busy, you know, commercial operation. And so there were a lot of businesses right down at the wharf. And this was one of the, the uh, grain market. Later became a sane house for repairing, storing fishing nets. So it was a working building. Uh, it was moved at one point uh, to the property behind the young house. This house uh, Taz and Kathy Smith live in now is hinted to be the oldest house in Orient, in the village. There's debate about it, but it might be. But this was moved to the back, and then the property was cut off, and um, the society purchased the property and the barn, and it's used as a storage facility. And right now, it's packed to the gills. We can't even, you can't even get in parts of it because there's so much in there. But there's some beautiful old carriages. You need a sled to go out tonight, tomorrow. You can come borrow the sled, ride around for a little bit. Yes, that's right. And there's all of these are called that I believe um, Bill can correct. But I, is this the doctors? I think this is the, the Greenport doctor would come out in that one. That was one of the collections uh, that were added. So you get an idea, that's just a storage, but it's filled with stuff. That looks good. It's much more crowded than that right now. Beyond the Red Barn, we have the Amanda Brown House. Now notice, the Red Barn was moved to the property. The Halleck Building was moved to the property. Amanda Brown House is moved to the property. 
So when I say the houses are part of the collection, we collected them. We literally collected them. And this is the tiny little Amanda Brown, uh, 1971. It was moved from the Orient Point Inn. The Orient Point Inn, for everybody, was across the street from the ferry. Gigantic building. Um, very, very, very large. Very fancy when it was first built. And um, it was a thriving, thriving um, boarding house hotel. The Amanda Brown, uh, there were three sisters, and it was located in Main Road, just east of the Congregational Church on the south side, opposite the gas station. It was part of a bigger house, and this was one little wing, and they pulled that wing off, and these three sisters um, used it, and the um, one sister, well, I'll get to it. Theodosia was the teacher. This was the Amanda Brown School but Theodosia was actually the teacher. And it was always known as Miss Amanda Brown's house. You can see it sitting there. Once again, notice how Orient is built up. That's the main road. And this is the way it ended up, out at the point, stuck on a pile. All right? It was built around 1862. Now, this is the Orient Point Inn. You can see the size. This is upstairs on the second or third floor. And you're looking down at the building. So um, it ended up there in 1939. And here, once again, do you see a little truck? You put a house on a trailer, move it down the road. Um, just for reference, you might recognize that building if you've ever taken the ferry. That's the same building that's out at the ferry right now. At the ferry terminal. So that's kind of neat. And there's Crowded Orient once again. <laughs> this is the main road. Le Orient Point is back here, and you're going through down toward um, Orient Village. But notice how built up it is at that time. Notice the heavy traffic also. Here it is coming down. Interesting, notice somebody's up on the roof, protected against wires, so that they could lift them up over it. But notice the traffic, you know, he's driving down the middle of the road, there's nobody. Here you can see a couple of cars, but the car's on a trailer, and there it is coming down. This is the village house, right here, and this is village lane, and once again it's being pulled right down in there, and it ended up on the property. Um, in 1973, they received a NISCA, a New York State Cultural Arts grant, and um, they built it as a center for teaching crafts and folk skills. Actually, one of the things that was the one purpose, they have a tremendous wood stove, a big, like, almost beehive stove in the back of it, and they were going to teach cooking over ashes and wood and all of that. It happened a little bit, but it hasn't happened since. We're working on it. So that's a little bit about a little house. Again, move to the property. 1983, the web house is given to the society. Given. I'll explain. Web house is over here on what's called Poquetuck Park. And I'll get to that in a second. Village house is on the other side, the east side of Village Lane. Web House is tucked away on the uh, west side of Village Lane, and it's associated with this park. This is a waterfront park. Here's the access to the water, and it's four acres, and all of that was donated to the society. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. George Latham gave the house and most of its furnishings to the society. He was one of the founding members. To give you a little background, he was an antique collector, and he had filled his house with antiques and didn't know what to do with new things. So what do you do? You go out and buy a house, bring it over to a park, and then you start filling that house up. No one ever lived in, in this house. It was just a private museum. And when he died, he gave the house, the collections inside, and the park 
to the society. Yes, George Latham. Uh, research on the Webb House leads the society to believe that it was built at the mouth of Sterling Creek about 1790 as an inn. Now, I add this. There are fights amongst some people. Some say, no, it's 1720. Other people say 1750. And there's arguments. I want to get the historical, you know, the history detectives to come out and figure it out. Because there, there are all sorts of documents that say one thing or another, which house it was, which house it wasn't. That's the hardest part. But it's old is the point, okay? It was a, uh, an inn and a tavern a long time ago. That's the bottom line. That's what it looks like. The inn was originally situated near the junction of Sterling Creek and Sterling Street in the village of Sterling. Now, you might not know the village of Sterling, but it's also known as Winter Harbor. But it's also known as Greenport. It had all of those names. Winter Harbor because the water doesn't freeze. It was a, a, a way you could get in and out all winter long. So it was known as Winter Harbor before that. Now, where, let me try to point out, this is downtown Greenport, over here. Um, this is the beginning of Sterling Creek. This is the hospital right here. This is Sterling Creek, and this is the building residing there somewhere in the 1700s. It got up and moved in the early 1800s, around 1810, to the junction of the main road and, uh, and oh, I wrote the wrong thing. Oh, no, main road and Route 48, the road coming out of Greenport and where the blinking light is, or it's right there. If, if you know where the restaurant there or Porgy's was, um, it was just east of that. Um, the house was moved up there. Um, a classic, and whether it's true or not story, it's somewhat debated. But it took them a couple of days to move the house. And it was a, a Saturday, and the oxen were pulling the house along, all teams of people and men were all working hard. And the sun began to set. And the farmer who owned the field said, it's the Sabbath. You can't work on the Sabbath. So everybody had to go home and wait until Monday to go two more hours of work. Now, whether that's true or not, there's some question, but it, it's long been told and I'm just adding to it. Probably. Now, in 1954, the building was about to be demolished. Take a look at it. It's not in great shape. And it was purchased by him. Again, he purchased it as his personal museum. You can see the building. This is the summer kitchen. You wanted to cook outside during the summer, not to be part of the house, to heat it all up. Um, this was not uh, able to be saved. All right? So just the main part was saved. And there it goes again. Another house moving to the campus. They put it up on a, tra uh, on a, uh, a trailer, blocks. Put it on a boat, a barge. The barge is now down in Sterling Creek, and it slowly but surely works its way out to Pocatuck Park. And that four-acre piece of land, he's already put down a foundation. He rolls the house up, and here it comes. If you watch the arrow, come on. The house rolls up there off the barge and slides into its foundation right there. Now, we actually have film of the whole thing, and I'm going to take two minutes and show it to you. So be patient. Um, okay, this is when it goes down near the water. This is when it's out in Orient. And this is a better thing. It's a little fuzzy, but I think you can make it out. Davis Brothers, they're still around. My wife taught sons of the Davis Brothers. And look at this, how it moves. Slowly but surely, they raised it and they pulled it along. They put it on a trailer, brought it down through the town, back down to the water. 
Here's the big crowds that are there watching. That's George Latham. And if you watch carefully, you'll see a house go by. There it is. Slowly but surely. Moves down. Ended up on the water. Um, they raised it up to put it on a barge. Um, when the house went on the barge, it was so heavy, it sank down. And they had to wait for the full moon, high tide. And it took a couple of days in order to get it out. But they eventually floated it out. And there it goes. That's out of Greenport, down by where the condos are. Look at the bug light behind it. If you look just behind it, you can see the bug light passing through. And here's the yacht club right here. The barge goes right up to Skipper's, the end of Skipper's Lane. And again, slowly but surely, it's pulled off. And it'll go on to dry land. And eventually, again, see how slow they move it. But it's slowly, the foundation is there. And eventually, the corners match up. And the house is there. My next door neighbor moved his house from Greenport to his property and never unpacked his clothes, never unpacked furniture, everything. The whole house just went and rolled it up on the foundations. Easy move. And this is what the house looked like um, when it was first set up. Uh, this is the front of the house. And I told you the summer kitchen. This has all been replaced. In other words, they added. And when you come out, not if you come out, but when you come out to see these houses, um, you'll walk in that door and you'll say, oh, wow, this is really old. That part of the house was built in 1950s. <laughs> it looks the oldest part because he took old lumber and recreated what he thought the summer kitchen should be. But the reality is that's a 1950s addition, if I can put it that way. The rest of the house is 17-somethings. So, this is the inside of it. This was a magazine article, Country Living. They did a Christmas um, splurge on it. And this is what the house looks like, decorated. And much of the same furniture is still there. So, again, you can come and look, see a lot of that. So, that's a little bit of information about the web house. And then the Vale House. It's called the Vale House. It acquired in 1972. It bought that house. Again, it's adjacent to the main campus, so all these properties blend together into one piece, basically. The house was built sometime before 1883. They belong to the Hollis family, but the Vales, one of the sons of the original Vales, uh, lived in it for a long time and got his name. As in a lot of houses in Orient, they have, even though the person hasn't lived in them for 100 years or 150, it's still the Dorman house. You know, even though no one's been there, the Dorman family, for 50 years, a lot of houses are identified by somebody's name. In the past, the Vale House acted as a store. It was called Shinbone Alley. Um, there's the sign. They used to sell things out of Shinbone Alley. This is some of the stuff that you could buy in the store. Eventually, though, in more recent years, it's been the home of the executive director. They started having a full-time executive director, and he or she would live as part of their salary in this house. Now, that house was original to the property. The village house was original to the property. Everything else was moved. Now, besides having seven houses, we have two cemeteries and a tree. And I'll try to talk a little bit about that. This is the, the, if you've never been, drive down to the end of Narrow River Road, um, the slave's burial ground. It says, slavery persisted in oyster ponds until about 1830. Here were buried some 20 slaves. Also lie the remains of Dr. Seth Tuttle, proprietor of Hog Pond Farm, and those of his wife, Maria. It was their wish that they be buried with their former servants. 
Now, there are stones there, but again, some of this might be very apocryphal. Um, whether anybody's really buried there is somewhat questionable. But it's been a tradition that it is, and it's been honored. Um, but you can walk in, there's a little, that the road is right behind that fence, and um, it's right on the water. A very nice, quiet little place. And the other burial ground, cemetery, that the society owns is um, tucked away. It's not as easy to get to, and it's really private property around most of it. But it's called the Browns Hill Burial Ground. In this narrow vale lie buried the early settlers of Oyster Ponds, Browns, Kings, Terrys, Tuttles, Vale, Youngs, and others. They are the original families. Um, other names still familiar in Orient, a locality on Long Island where the present meets up closely with the distant past. Now, there are stones in there from the 1600s. That's how far back that cemetery goes. And then finally, we acquired a tree in 1969. The town was threatening to do things with the tree, and the people felt protective of the tree and decided that it would petition, and eventually it got the tree from the town. So the Historical Society is really in charge of the tree. Um, the sign says, this was planted by the early settlers of Orient, stood here on July 4th, 1776. Um, I'm going to show you this. This is March 1929. Um, Martha Terry, who lived in Orient, her daughter, you might know, Priscilla Bull. Um, Priscilla is her daughter, and Priscilla gave me uh, this a while ago. And it brings together a, a, a number of different things. Um, this, is a, this is her writing. The, the, Speech I gave at graduation at Pocatuck Hall. And she redid the speech for the Washingtonian dinner. Do you remember I told you that before? She presented this at the dinner on March 1929. Um, this is her comments. And it's the old Buttonwood Speaks. And what it is is a reminiscence of the tree. It's the tree speaking out. I learned of the change in its name through rumors about the year 1836. And somehow, even now, as I look at Orient, it seems like a different place from what it was called Oyster Ponds. Oyster Ponds never saw so many homes as there are here today. It never saw cement roads or sidewalks or electric lights, to say nothing of the automobiles going 40 miles an hour or the airplanes and dirigibles and even the radio. But modern Orient never saw the beautiful lane that That's led from here to the wharf. Way back. It never saw the pretty old-fashioned dresses the ladies used to wear, nor the carriages in which they rode. You saw some I of that? I am very glad that I have lived to see both, and hope that I may stand a silent observer and listener for many more years to come. A little story. So... I would like to thank all these people who helped me get through this. Um, Amy and Bill both work for the Historical Society, and so does Harold. And finally, Priscilla herself for giving me all that information. So um, that is all I'm going to say. And I'll say, are there any questions? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it, there's a different, uh, there's a long history of, of its name. But yes. Uh, it was just, uh, it sometimes it's referred to as the Orange Web House from its history back earlier. Other questions? You, yes, way in the back. Um, through, Generation, uh, generous donations of the people who are there. We, we, and again, without going through a whole bunch of things, um, we have a budget of around 300,000 or so, believe it or not. And we have an endowment that gives us about 80,000 of that. 
and the rest we have to raise. So um, we have a summer benefit, the North Fork Fresh, our main um, areas. We have membership, which is another major donation category. Um, what else? Grants. Yep. We uh, we just, uh, for instance, got a thirty thousand dollar grant from the Gardner Lionel uh, Lion Gardner. They gave us a grant to do some uh, work on the strategic and master plan. That kind of thing is all coming together. But it's really the bottom line is donations. Uh, we receive um, there are a number of generous people who keep us going. And that's really the, that's a good question. I appreciate it. And any of you who want to donate, feel free because your money goes to a good cause. Yes. Well, just to add to that, I have become a member several years ago and I've really enjoyed buying the books that you've sold and reading them. Uh, I can't give you a big donation, but I congratulate you for what you're doing. I wanted to ask, are there, are there other buttonwood trees in the area? I never heard of one out here. Um, there has to, there has to be more of them. They have big leaves and I, I'm, I'm just not sure, but I'm, I'm, I'll try to find some for you, but they're around. Once they come out, they're really obvious to see, but that's been there for a long, long time. Yes. These buildings showing are they open to the public yes that's a good question too um they're they're open thursday saturday and sunday from about may till the end of september okay because some of the building well i guess most of the buildings that are open are heated but um thursday saturday and sunday and there are docents again here's a great opportunity if you're bored and have nothing to do with your life we're always looking for docents um, to show people around, to explain what it is. But the um, opening sh uh, to the rooms on May 29th or 30th, it's, it's the Saturday, the end of May. The six bedrooms upstairs in the village house each have a different theme. And they've been cycled for the last three years. So this will be the first. So, There'll, there'll be different themes in each of the rooms and to, to show the, our collection. So it'll show off one portion of it. Um, the main exhibit in the schoolhouse opens the following, the end of June. So from May until s middle of September, the end of September. Um, it's open, it's free of charge um, to come and look and go through the collections. How do you get there off the North Road? You drive out like you're going to the ferry? Yes. You get to across the causeway. Right. Yeah. Um, there's a um, the candy man. Yeah. Just past the candy man, first right. There's a monument right in the middle, Civil War monument. If you turn right at the Civil War monument, you go down that road and all of this is on your left. The business, yes, the post office and the, the, the yes, post office, ice cream, and um, in general store. Thank you. Where's Popatuck Hall? Popatuck Hall is, um, how can I say this? It's on the west side of Village Lane. It was built in the 1870s. And it, again, and this is a good little story. Just It was built purely and completely by the donations of the people of Oregon. And it has been supported completely and entirely by the donations of the people of Orient. It, it's been self, and it was built for the people of Orient to use as a community center. It's really a, a wonderful place that's out there. Somebody else I saw. Yes, I. Do you know how many people visit? Um, Bill would be a better. How many people? 1,500, you know, it's, it's, you know, in a year maybe. Um, I'm not sure. When, when you talk about if we have an event, there might be 250 people. Uh, are they visitors, you know, just because they go through the, you know, it, it's not really, really, 
you don't have to worry about the crowds, put it that way. All right, you can plan your own trip. How's that? Yes? Plus, more than 300 kids um, right. visit every year, and um, it's really a, a lot of fun, and they learn a lot It's because it's so real. Jan is our education chairperson, so she's always um, politicking for the education program. And it's a good point, is that there's a lot of kids that come through, and they learn an awful lot. And there's a lot of connections between the historical society and the school. Um, without going long, the kids are going to Ellis Island, but the historical society has prepared all sorts of things to make that experience uh, much better put it that way. Anybody else? You now know all about the houses. If I give you a test, you'll all... Oh, thanks very much for spending an afternoon. Okay. In, in 20 minutes or... Yeah, oh yeah, well, I'll be long. I'll be long.